we're going to talk today about the fine line of discrimination in communication. For an overview for my presentation, um, first we're going to talk about the background of uh, the study that I conducted, the framework of that study, and the research question for it, the methodolo methodology of the study, the findings, and the contribution. said that hate is taught. You don't come out of the womb hating anyone or even with any prejudices. Um, we don't, even though we look like ourselves, we come out of the womb, so we can't have prejudices um, in hating. So where do these prejudices and these differences come from? Why do they become so prevalent generation after generation? Well, this happens by uh, these differences are kept and rebuilt and affirmed generationally through words, uh, most basically through communication. Words are used to otherize certain groups, to degrade them and oppress them. And in some cases, these words become a part of contemporary discourse, indoctrinated, indoctrinated discrimination on a societal level that we still have not grown out of as a society. As McDaniel says in 2021, this issue of perceived discrimination in speech and other kinds of communication is a pressing one as pervasive issues like homophobia, racism, and sexism are being brought to the forefront of public and private consciousness like never before. There have been many scholars looking into how this process occurs, but not too many looking at how it currently affects our specific conversations now. There's a form of discrimination in, in most kinds of communication that we use uh, from jokes to culture to everyday talk. As a young black man in America, my social consciousness is often burdened by this disheartening discrimination um, felt by so many in this country that don't look like me as well. And, but my uh, personal experience um, doesn't really reach the implicit and explicit forms of discrim discriminatory communication. Um, that of women, of non-heterosexual people, uh, or someone outside of my race. Even if an individual occurs, discrimination is often interpreted on behalf of a group. It's believed that all members of a certain group are offended by the same thing. However, this belief requires a nuanced intersection of race, gender, age, sexual orientation, and more groups. Seeing that these groups are not simply the sum of their parts, but individuals with varying tolerances for discriminatory speech. This particular study investigates what constitutes something communicated as discriminatory, and if there is a distinguishable line between what is wrong to say and what is permissible, not for specific groups, but for everyone. For that reason, it's important to get um, particip participants of many different races, genders, and sexual orientations to deepen the reach of a potential commonality of discussion. The methodology I, I use for this uh, study was um, I used convenience sampling um, to find two individual interviewees and four participants of a single focus group. All of these meetings were in person and audio recorded for accuracy. And the contents of these interviews and focus groups was then analyzed using Owen's thematic analysis process and team. The findings of the study yielded many differences between answers from the individuals as you may have you may have seen or you may have guessed. Differences included definitions of discrimination, frequency of personal experiences with discriminatory speech, and thoughts on where that line of demarcation between what's acceptable and what's not acceptable was. When asked what was the, their personal definition of discrimination, um, the first interviewee said that it was a word or interview, interviewee one said that was a word to describe someone else's feeling towards something that happened to them. The second interviewer said that it was when a person gets treated differently, poorly, because of their differences in race, religion, or anything really. And a focus group member said it was active hatred towards someone else because they don't look like them. So as, as you may have been able to guess, discrimination is a very hard thing to really put a finger on, even for um, a lot of different people uh, having their same definitions or having different definitions coming together. 
However, a glaring similarity in both individual interviews and the one focus group was one word used in all three. That was ignorance. When asked what was the main factor in discriminatory uh, actions or behavior, there were three different situations or three different people. Both the interviewees and one of the uh, interviewees from the focus group used ignorance. And this was the first interview, interviewer or interviewee. She said, ignorance, that they just don't know the other person. They haven't really tried to get to know them so they can just, so they can see that the stereotype isn't true. Second one said, I think the reason for that ignorance is different, but at the end of the day, it's ignorance. Like whether you were raised that way and then now you're a grown person, you didn't take the time to figure out that for yourself. That's ignorance. And the focus group member said, a lot of people are just ignorant. They just don't get it. They can try, but there's no way they're going, they're going to sit there and understand what you're saying or telling them. They generally don't know what they're doing wrong. You can try to explain it to them, but they're just not going to understand. It seems that regardless of the situation or the person that's giving their opinion, communication seems most discriminatory when it comes from a place of ignorance. Following the Owen method of thematic analysis, looking for recurring themes, ignorance was used in a context near the middle or end of the discussion, signaling a sort of surrender to the inevitable underpinning that signals discrimination. So in all those different instances, it was kind of a feeling of, you know, people just don't know. You can't tell people what they don't know. You can't expect people to know something that they just don't know. And that's a, um, sort of surrendering to the fact that we live in a, in a society that is very diverse and that people just, you can't expect people to know things that they haven't come up with. Contributions of the findings, because discriminatory speech is often felt most potent in power down situations, meaning majorities discriminating against minorities. Those majorities do not feel the need to be knowledgeable about the feelings and sentiments of minorities because it's not required in their ways of life. So for them to be, for majorities to be ignorant, it really doesn't feel like ignorance to them because it's just the way that life is. Conversely, minorities must constantly be mindful of the thoughts of majority members, as that is of the sentiments, that's of the sentiments held by employers, leaders, and decision makers in their professional lives. Another point detailed in 2018's What Constitutes Discrimination in Everyday Talk from the Journal of Language from the Journal of Language and Social Psychology. This form of soft discrimination based on pure ignorance is often disregarded by those it is directed at or even made in light of as a member of another, another member of the focus group called a run-in with a grocery store worker from when he was young and he was with his aunt, he was a person of color and, he's, and the uh, cashier said, I'm sure that you can buy this, they're buying something pretty expensive. Are you sure you have the money to buy this? And he said, I laughed because I wasn't that old. I didn't think she meant anything crazy by it. I thought it was just a joke. But it was probably a serious reaction the woman had because we were people of color. The limitations of this study, like many other like it, is that ultimately subject subjectivity rules when it comes to perception. Communication changes as do people's attitudes toward it, which, plays, which places this topic in a gray area. So just like the, um, the definitions of discrimination show, people have different definitions and people are going to be um, offended or not offended by different things and it doesn't necessarily have to do with what group you think they fall into. However, if discrimination and communication can be narrowed down to one concept such as ignorance, that makes identifying prohibitive lines in our social societal discourse that much simpler.